Well, good morning. Great to be with you. God's um, peace to you. Our text for this morning is the, the reading from Hebrews chapter 3. Uh, just listen again to this one verse. Therefore, holy brothers who share in this heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Well, that's a great place to start because that's really uh, what the whole book of Hebrews is about, fixing your thoughts on Jesus. So I hope you're ready for the Hebrew challenge. I invited uh, our entire congregation to join in in reading through the book of Hebrews over the next six weeks, which is really a good and helpful way to study the scriptures. A lot of times we get kind of caught up in the practice of only looking at one or two little verses, very short passages, and we never kind of look at the broader context from which they're taken. And that's an okay thing to do. That's a good way to study the Bible too. But from time to time, it's good to sit down and just read the book that, it's in, that verse is in uh, from beginning to end so you can see the broader context of that. It can layer, add a lot of layers of, of depth and meaning uh, to certain passages for us. So I hope that you'll have the opportunity in the coming weeks to read through uh, the book of Hebrews. And this past week, about uh, just over 50 people sent me a note that said, I'm in, sign me up. I will try to read through the book of Hebrews 10 times over the next six weeks. Well, even if you don't read it 10 times, you read it one time or two times. If you're willing to try that, send me a note. It just says, I, uh, I'm in. It's my uh, email's in the bulletin this morning. And uh, I'll send you some notes periodically, once or twice a week, just maybe some thoughts that will help you in the process of reading through that. It is not the easiest book in the Bible to read through. It's not the easiest one, but it, there is a lot of great stuff in this book, so I invite you to be a part of the Hebrews challenge. And this week I sent out an email that just kind of got everybody started with three little things to remember as you uh, begin the process. Here's the first one. There, no guilt. Not, if, if this becomes a guilt thing for you, it's just going to ruin the whole thing. So don't do that. Um, Jesus is not going to love you more if you read the book of Hebrews 10 times, and he's not going to love you less if you don't read the book of Hebrews 10 times. So don't put that kind of pressure on yourself, like this is an obligation or a duty to do. Just seek God's blessing and, and enjoy the process of reading God's word. So that's the first one, no guilt. The second one is this, just read. Just read. If you get to a point and you just have absolutely no clue what it's talking about, don't stop and beat yourself up and, and let Satan tell you you're dumb, you're stupid, are you really a Christian? All these other people get this. You're the only person on planet Earth who doesn't understand this. This is so simple, but you don't get it. What is wrong with you? Don't fall for that stuff either. Just read through the tough stuff. Just kind of keep going. Really savor it when you get something. You know, really soak that in and say, this is great. Maybe underline a passage if you really like it. But just read from beginning to end. I promise you this. If you come to church these six weeks, hear these sermons, read through the book once or twice or three or ten times, you will grow in your knowledge of God's word and uh, most of all, to know Jesus Christ better. That's the way Bible study works anyway. I have a master's in divinity. I don't read through that and know everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get to points too and go, hey, I have no clue what that is saying. It's going to take me a while for that one to, to figure out. Getting to know God is like that. He's bigger than you are. You know, you don't even know yourself very well. Why would you expect to read through one book of the Bible and know God perfectly? Don't put that pressure on yourself. Just read. And the third one is this. Pray. Pray. Honest. Ask God to give you his Holy Spirit. You, you heard that passage from Luke today. He opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. That tells you the Bible is not a natural thought for sinful mankind. It does not come, we don't go, oh, that's exactly what I was thinking. No, all of our thoughts are not his. His are not ours. His word is foreign to sinful mankind. So pray that the Holy Spirit will open your eyes, your ears, your heart to hear, to grow in wisdom and knowledge of God and of your Savior, Jesus Christ. So no guilt, just read and pray. That might be a helpful way for you to get started. The second thing I would just share with you this morning a little bit, Pastor Matt did a great job of starting things off last week and talking to you about Jesus being greater than the angels. I wanted to tell you just one quick thing this morning about the structure of Hebrews. Uh, that'll help you if you're going to take this on and read it. I made some copies of, of an outline back there that uh, maybe it'll help you if to, just to see the big picture. And I'll send that out tomorrow morning if you've uh, emailed me, so you'll get it in the, as an email tomorrow morning. Uh, just an outline of the book of Hebrews. And there's just one thing I want to say about that outline that might help you in the process. 
You know, if you go to a basketball game and you walk into a gymnasium and you've never seen a basketball game and you have no clue what happens in basketball, that ex- you're going to get nothing out of that experience. It's, not, it's just going to be very confusing for you. Now, at the very least, you need to know that there are two teams on the floor. You know, one is wearing white uniforms and the other one's wearing red uniforms and that this team is trying to put the basketball through that rim over there and this team is trying to put the ball through that basket over there. And when you do that, you get points and whoever has the most points at the end of the time wins. And oh yeah, by the way, each team is trying to stop the other team from doing that. You know, if you don't know that, it's not going to be a good experience for you. So there's a couple things about Hebrews that you might want to know that you'd get a lot more out of it that way. And this morning, uh, I just want to share with you uh, briefly a thing about uh, the structure uh, of that book. It's kind of a, I don't know, just an important little deal about how it's organized. So one thing you need to know about that is just who it's written to. It's written to the Jews, the the Hebrew people. And, And it's written sometime before 70 A.D. So just think about that. Sometime between 40 and 70 A.D., kind of place yourself about 20 or 30 years removed from Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. All right, so you can kind of just in your mind think back, what's it like 20 years ago for you, 1995? What was going on in your life in 1995? For them, it was like, oh, yeah, that was when Jesus was crucified. Risen. So pretty close to those events. And people who are, here's the most important part of that is, they were, they were Jewish Old Testament people. So you kind of hear a lot of offhand references to the Old Testament stuff, and the author just kind of assumes you know that. So if you're not familiar at all with the, the Old Testament, when he just refers and throws those things out, you're going to be like, what, what, what is that talking about? I don't get that. Well, the Hebrew people did, so you kind of have to go to the Old Testament a little bit here and there, and kind of... Uh, find that out. But they were still practicing the Old Testament traditions and rituals uh, of Israel. They were in the middle of this massive transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament. For 2,000 years, God was making himself known through the nation of Israel until this Messiah came, and now all of a sudden it was the New Testament and everything changed. It's really important that you know that the things of the Old Testament, they were temporary. They were temporary. They were temporary ways for God to make himself known to sinful mankind. Now, granted, 2,000 years is a long temporary. Huh? Yeah, have you ever had something temporarily for 2,000 years? That's a long temporary. So they'd gotten very used to and very comfortable with the traditions and rituals of Old Testament Israel. But God had always said, hey, when the Messiah gets here, he's going to be better than all this stuff, so no need for this anymore. Now just focus on Jesus Christ. So that's what's going on here with these Hebrews. That's who the author is talking about. He's trying to convince them that Jesus is better than all those Old Testament practices they used to do. Let go of all those things. Jesus is more important. It would kind of be like talking a bunch of Lutherans into Jesus is more important than the red hymnal. You know, somebody's been talking me into Jesus. You know, when I back when I was... 12, and they introduced a new hymnal. I was like, scandal. And my mom and dad said, Paul, sit down. It's okay. Jesus is bigger <laughs> than the red hymnal. It's true. See? Yeah. Okay. So it's easy to kind of look at the Jewish people and go, huh, this is so easy to figure out. But uh, uh, yeah, New Testament people, we do the same goofy things, don't we? We get attached to things that are temporary, the things that are uh, you know, man-made. So the same uh, thing applies to both of us. So really important that we kind of know that. Here's what the author of Hebrews said at the very beginning, right at the outset. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Those Old Testament things, they were just temporary pictures of what God really is like. 
It's like seeing a picture of Disney World or the Grand Canyon and going, yeah, I kind of got it. But then when you get there, you're like, holy cow, that picture doesn't even come close to doing it justice. Not even close. Once you've seen the real thing, once you have seen Jesus Christ, these shadows, these pictures, they mean nothing anymore. That's what the author of Hebrews was after. And that was the main point. It's probably something else you ought to know about the, the, the book of authors. That's the main point. That God really did speak through these Old Testament things. He spoke in many and various ways, loud and clear, through the traditions, the rituals, the experiences, the history of Israel. God spoke very clearly about critically important things like sin, like God's holiness, like reconciliation and atonement, like the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins, like God's law and truth, and how sinful mankind is separated from a holy God and how God brings us back to him. God spoke loud and clear about who he is and how he saves people and about how this Messiah would be coming. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So... Listen. Thank you. <laughs> At least somebody is with me this morning. <laughs> Listen. Yeah, he's spoken to us the clearest. You heard. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of the heart of God. This is the per you see Jesus, you see God. Listen to what he has to say. These, the words of Jesus are the life that will sustain you. Okay, one last thing you want to know before you read in. Just you know, kind of like the rules of basketball. You want to know the rules of Hebrews. The last thing is just the structure, the order. Again, I told you there's an outline back there. There is just one thing you need to know as you're reading through the book of Hebrews. Because um, I thought you were going to say this morning when the Hebrews guy, you didn't know if he drank beer or coffee. Because the book of Hebrews is all over the place. So he's either like on a caffeine high or he's drunk. I think maybe he's ADD. I don't know. But he's not, he's not super organized. And it, it's, it's tough because you're reading along and you're kind of following point after point, And then you're like, where did this come from? This has nothing to do with what he was just talking about. Where did this come from? There is a reason for that. The structure of Hebrews is this. There's three big sections. Right? There's three big sections, and in each section, there are three or four points that he's making. So he's comparing three or four things from the Old Testament, how Jesus is better than. So three sections, three or four points in each one. So, for example, in the first section, Jesus is greater than the prophets. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than Aaron the high priest. Right? And then section two, section three. Now, here's the catch. Here's the catch. Five times as he's kind of going through each point, either in the middle of a point or between points, he pauses for a little interruption, a little side note. Who would do that? <laughs> See, uh-huh. <laughs> what he's trying to say. He, he stops, and in your, perhaps in your English Bible, it might have a little heading that says, a warning against da-da-da-da, or an exhortation, if you're reading the King James, an exhortation about this. Five times that occurs. Three of those interruptions are in the first section. So the first, you know, you got to get through that first section. It's a little tough. But can you see why that would kind of frustrate your reading? You're cruising along through these very logical, sequential points, which we Americans kind of love, and the Hebrews don't, by the way. And all of a sudden, boom, there's this interruption. And every one of those five interruptions is about the same thing. It, it's this. Listen to the words of God. Don't drift away from them. Don't forget them. Don't listen to the voices of this world. Take these things to heart. The word of God is living and active, sharper than double, any double-edged sword. Some of the best passages, the best verses in Hebrews are in those sections of warning. Do not let your heart harden. Do not become insensitive to the word of God. Five times. That ought to tell us something. It's really important, the author of Hebrews says, God is speaking to us through his son for crying out loud, would you listen? So what you would say is like a good teacher. You don't just rattle off 12 points to your class. You stop 
every so often and say, are you getting this? Are you listening? Are you paying attention? Are you engaged? So you kind of want to know that little thing about these interruptions. So grab one of those outlines and you can kind of see where those interruptions are. And that will make a little bit more sense to you, I think. All right, Moses. Who the heck is this Moses guy? This is something worth considering because, like Pastor Shalee said, our first reaction to this is, I don't, I don't think I have to talk any of you into, you know, hey, oh, I've always thought Moses was greater than Jesus. What's this new revelation you have? If you read the scriptures, if you believe it's God's word, it's authoritative, of what it says about Jesus is true, I, I, I don't know how you could read the scriptures and come away with that conclusion. So I'm probably not talking any of you into that, but... Put yourself in their shoes. This letter written to those Jewish people 20 or 30 years after Jesus had lived, died, and rose from the dead. That was only 20 years ago. And Moses was the guy, of the greatest guy in Israel's nation and religion for 2,000 years. You heard that passage read from you from Deuteronomy this morning. I'm those... Those kind of words are not spoken about anybody else. He's the only guy who spoke to God face to face. God did incredible miracles for him. Nobody else has risen up like Moses. Uh, His resume is astounding. What God did in and through him to rescue his people is, it's just unrivaled. You know, he was saved when he was a little baby from uh, the Pharaoh was killing all the newborn Israelite children. He was saved. He was put in the river and, and raised in the Pharaoh's household. He was chosen by God to go toe to toe with Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world, to free them. You, the, the 10 plagues, he does the 10 plagues. And after 400 years of bondage to slavery to the most powerful nation on earth, he leads them out of slavery, takes him out into the wilderness. He goes to the top of Mount Sinai. He speaks face to face with God. He receives the Ten Commandments, instructions for the tabernacle, how to worship for the high priests. He writes the first five books of the Bible. It's just unbelievable the miraculous things Moses did, the things God did through him. He was as close to a divine figure as you can find in the scriptures. It's understandable why the Jewish people thought so highly of Moses. He was the guy. And now this Jesus guy who was a contemporary of theirs, you know, they're kind of still, was he going to stand the test of time? Fifty years from now, maybe nobody will even say anything about Jesus. Maybe he'll just be a passing thought, not so quick to replace Moses with Jesus. Well, it really is not our essential struggle. I I don't think I have to talk any of you into loving Moses less and loving Jesus more this morning. But it does bring up this question for us. It does bring up this question. Why, Why is it that we are so, our hearts are so quickly drawn to, to mere mortals. Why are we so quick to put our faith, our hope, our trust, our salvation, our life into other human beings? You know, it's probably not the idea that we struggle with that Jesus is greater than anything. It's, it's believing it and actually putting it into practice of living that way. If we're really honest with ourselves, we would see that our sinful, broken hearts, just how sinful and broken they are, how attracted our hearts are, how drawn we are for the approval of of men, for the affections of other human beings, for... You know, there's some beautiful talented, charismatic, smart, gifted, artistic, helpful, kind, caring people in this world who meet some of our deepest needs. And it's easy for our sinful hearts to quickly be attached to people and to to put our hope in them quickly. 
only to find out eventually that they just can't bear the weight of being our hope and our salvation. You know, that's one of the funny things about the story of Moses, if you'll read, is to see how fickle the people were during Moses' time. You know, they, they praised Moses when the ten plagues were happening and they were walking through the Red Sea out into the wilderness to freedom. Moses was their hero. But only it was a matter of time before they were going to Moses and complaining, hey, we're hungry, we're thirsty, why did you lead us out here? This is crazy, you brought us here to kill us. What kind of leader are you? Uh, their, their affections for Moses were all over the place. We love you, we hate you, we love you, we hate you, we love you, we hate you. It drove Moses crazy. He was like, God, get rid of these people, I can't take this anymore. One of my favorite lines is when he leads them to the border of Canaan, and they go in and the, ten spies look at the, land, uh, the 12 spies look at the land, they come back and they say, we can't take the land, and this is what they say. Let's pick a new leader who will take us back to slavery. <laughs> yeah, wait, wait, what is that? We'll take a, let's find a new leader who leads us back to slavery. Now, see, that, that's the way they were with Moses. They were just kind of all over the place. So it was like, ah, we love him, we hate him. When he meets our needs and gives us what we want, we love him. When he doesn't, when he disappoints us or frustrates us, we hate him. Why, why are our human hearts that way? We do that all the time, too. You know, people do something to help us. They give us what we want. They meet our needs. Boom, hero, love this guy. Man, you're the greatest. You're the best. I, I'm just, man, you're cool. So awesome. Then the first time they disappoint us, man, you're a jerk. What is up with you? I'm never going to talk to you again. I'm just, I mean, we're just, it's like this, just, you know, oh, this wake of broken relationships. That's just kind of the way we work. I, it makes me think of the, a story in the New Testament in Acts chapter 14, because the same thing happened to the apostle Paul. Paul and Barnabas were on their missionary journey. They went to a city called Lystra. And when they got there, Paul was speaking to the crowd about Jesus and there was a, a crippled man sitting there in the front of the crowd, and he saw him, and he healed the crippled man. And the crowd saw this, and they stood up, and they started worshiping Paul and Barnabas, and they were getting prepared to offer sacrifices to them. And they said, the gods have come to us in human form. It's because they'd healed somebody. And Paul said, no, 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 no. We're just, we're just mortals like you. I'm telling you about the one true living God who really can save you from the grip of sin and death of this life. And so they, they went in an instant from worshiping Paul. Then a couple people came in from the neighboring town where Paul had just been and said, hey, this guy's a real troublemaker. You want to watch out for him. He was just in our town. You're not going to believe what he did. And the, and the word spread through the crowd. And they went from worshiping and offering sacrifices to saying, let's stone the guy. They dragged him out to the edge of the town to stone him to death. What is it about the human heart that can turn from worship to, to killing someone, boom, on the turn of a dime? You know, if we're honest with ourselves, we, we do that all the time. We think, we think people are the greatest thing in the world, our, our hope, our affection, everything is, wow, this is, this is it, I found that. Until the first time they disappoint us. Until the first time they do something that we don't like. You know, no, there is no person that can bear that weight. There's no person that can bear the weight of being your hope, of your salvation. You can't do that either. You can't be somebody's salvation. Don't try to be. You're going to fail somebody. We are flawed, broken, deeply ruined, sinful people. We cannot save ourselves, much less someone else. See, the, the author of Hebrews knew that that's just part of the human condition. We all have this problem of lifting up people who have helped us on a pedestal. And even though we confess Jesus is greater than all, our lives look something quite different. Quite different. And so the author of Hebrews grabs our attention in a very powerful way. Just, just think about some of the people in your life that have been in that position. It gives some serious thought this week. 
to times that, that you have done that. I, I promise you, there's not, I, I spent the week thinking about it. It didn't, come, it didn't take me much time at all. To come up with times I have done that to other people or when people have done that to me. You, you just think about somebody that you, you held up on a pedestal and said, man, and then they disappointed and you, and you disowned them. It's just such a common thing for us. You know, a doctor or nurse who literally saves your life through their medical practice. You think about other things too, a pastor or a teacher who gives you counsel that turns your life around, a, a business person who provides something you desperately need, a social worker who saves you, who uh, saves you from trouble, a spouse or a child who meets your deepest needs for intimacy and closeness. You know, the list could go on and on. It's a powerful thing when somebody fills some of our deepest needs for hearts to become attached to them, for us to put our faith, our hope, our trust in them. The author of Hebrews says the same thing he says to those Hebrews. There is no equal for Jesus. There is no replacement. There is no other. He is the one and only Son of God, crucified for your sins, risen from the dead, reconciles you back to God, opens the doors of heaven. He is the only one who can bear the weight of being your Savior. He truly is greater than all. That's why the author of Hebrews starts with those powerful words. He's the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of God himself. And by his word, he sustains you. Only his word can do that. Only Jesus. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. For he is our great high priest, our great apostle, our savior, and our Lord. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Jesus, we know in our heads, we know from reading your scriptures that you are greater than anyone, greater than anything, and the only one who can meet the deepest needs of our souls. Lord, because we are broken and sinful and empty inside, we run around in this life trying to fill that emptiness with all kinds of things. We often put that weight on other people. Sometimes it's things, sometimes it's accomplishments, sometimes it's attention. Just desperately trying to fill that emptiness inside of us with the things we can see and touch and taste in this life, the things that you've created you reminded us today in, the word, the only, in your word, the only thing that will accomplish that is you. Only thing that will accomplish that is Jesus Christ. Faith, trust, hope in him. Lord, give us your Holy Spirit. Open our eyes, help us to be honest about our sin, help us to own up to it. Stop thinking so highly of ourselves. Lord, we don't want to lift up Moses, we don't want to lift up anybody except Jesus Christ. May you be lifted up in this place. May you be lifted up in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. We worship you and you alone this day. Thank you for being our Savior, our Lord, our Savior and our friend. Be with us this day, Lord. We thank you for your precious word in Jesus' name. Amen.